Okay, well, I am going to introduce to us, and most of you guys know this guy, Tom Douglas. Why don't you come on up, Tom, and we can, why don't we give him a round of applause. <laughs> Tom, in many ways, grew up in this church and grew up in the faith in this church and come, came to Christ in this church. Yeah, and this church has a, has a ministry and a legacy that goes far beyond these walls. And Tom <clears throat> gave his life to Christ and still serving him in various capacities as a pastor in other ways. And the Lord has brought he and his family back here to us to help shepherd, help lead, help, um, help us to continue to grow in Christ. And Tom has become a good friend of mine, and I'm grateful for his presence, and I'm grateful for his leadership, not only just in my life, but as a congregation. So he is one of our shepherds who watches over us. And... He's going to bring the word this morning. God has gifted him in many ways, and one is to open the word of God. And we'll look to that with expectation, along with a number of people here that God has gifted to bring the word. So I am grateful for Tom on many levels. I'm grateful for him as a friend, as a partner in ministry. And so I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to turn to the word as we continue, of course, in our series in First John. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much for my friend, God, most and more importantly, your son. God, we're grateful that you have partnered him with us here in this place. You've partnered us together, God, in this community so that your word would continue to go forward. God, that it would continue to transform our lives. God, that it would make a difference in our homes in our workplaces, God, in our schools, Lord, in the various places that we travel, even until the end of the world. God, we uh, are waiting with expectation as to what you would continue to speak to us today. God, I ask that you would give us um, ears that would hear, God, hearts that would be open. God, as Tom opens his heart and opens the word, God, I ask that he would feel your presence, God, feel your pleasure, Lord, and I ask that you would bless my friend, God, as he brings this word to us, God, and I ask that we would, again, put these things into practice and continue to live them out. So thank you, Father, for meeting with us, God. Thank you for sending your Son, God. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is present, and God, be glorified in us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Tom. Well, good morning. I would ask you to do something for me. If you have an electronic Bible, have that open, but I'd ask you to open up your Bible in the pew in front of you so that you can actually like, see the words of Scripture on a page. Um, thankful for Dan Galvez because he's officially the oldest member of the Shepherd team, but I'm a close second because Jim left to do other things because he's been called. Glad to see you guys back, by the way. Open that Bible and turn to page 1055. That's where we're going to be this morning. I'm up here because several of us have been trying to give the man of God who he, God has called here, named Dave Spooner, to have time to work on his final project, also known as giving birth to a final project of his Doctor of Ministry program. And I'm privilege to, to help my brother do just that by f filling or bringing my own shoes this morning so as we open the word. And we're going to look at the second chapter of 1 John. We're going to be in uh, verses 18 through 27. And if you didn't get notes today, I would encourage you, I'm going to give you permission to go up right now out and get uh, uh, one of the copies of the notes, not because I think what I have to say is so important, but I think that God's word is that important. I am, have been praying that God would make us expectant to hear from him, that we would be ready to hear from his word. And so as we open the word today, you're going to hear the word, hopefully, and not my words. That's a major value of this church. Don't misunderstand the word is the thing not what I have to say. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here in this passage as we've walked through 1 John. So you've got John, this wise old pastor who basically at this point in his life is functioning more like a bishop. He's writing these words to churches in and around Ephesus. 
And he's very concerned about the churches that God has given him to care for. He's very concerned about some things that have been rumbled around and some things that have been taught about who Jesus is that is apart from the biblical teaching of who Jesus is. And as we enter this passage today, we're going to see that as we read the passages, you're going to go, wow, this is everything that John's been building up to in 1 John. Like right out of the gate, he starts talking much like he did in his gospel. He's really glad, I think, that he's written the gospel because he's got this teaching about who Jesus is and, and the, you know, that we would believe who Jesus is and that he was a real guy and he walked around and he was the Messiah, the anticipated Messiah. Because the first four verses of chapter 1, you can flip back, it's okay. Actually, if you're in the Pew Bible, you just look on the left page. And there it is, the first four verses sound very similar to the Gospel of John. And we immediately see John trying to establish his role as an apostle. He's like, listen, church, my word that I shared with you has authority because I was with Jesus. I am only sharing what he told me to share. Eyewitness testimony. If you notice, he does a lot of, uh, we saw, we heard, we were there. Church, I'm writing to you because I have authority because of who Jesus was in my life. The proximity. I walked with him. That's important to be around people who have been in close proximity to Jesus. Okay? That's the word helps us do that. And so he's, he's setting this up because he's afraid for his church. He finds that they're in danger. In fact, grave danger, as if there's any other kind. Ha ha. They're in danger of walking away from the truth. Is that a danger for us today? As we walk in here today, is it a danger for us? It absolutely is. One of the things I love to say is that we leak truth. We're, we're leaky. I wish we were I. I'll just put myself under the bus. I wish that I were more of a vessel that would contain truth and hold on to it more than I do. I leak. So I've got to continually refill my soul with the truth. And that's why John's writing this, this little 1 John letter because he's saying, look, refill what you've already heard. You know the truth. And he's going to call us back to that. And we need to continually go back to a source that can keep us from error. Which is why the, the key idea we must remain faithful to biblical truth is what I believe squaring with what this word says. Because John is setting up a situation where he's driving this line in, in reality, in existence, in the lives of the people. He's saying you either believe A and it's not even B, A or B. It's not A or B. John is saying you either believe A, which is the biblical truth, or you believe not A, which is everything else. That's, that's the, the sense, that's the feeling, that's the importance, that's the danger avoidance that John's writing to us today because it's still true. It's either A or not A. It's the biblical witness of how we live forever, which John clearly delineates in our passage today. Eternal life is what he's saying is what we get when we follow the biblical Jesus. And we must get back into the Bible regularly to refill us because we leak. And so I want to read his word in full where we will be this morning. I would ask that you would follow along. He starts in by saying, Dear children, this is the last hour. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. 
For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the... What does it say? Such a person is the Antichrist. That's big. You better have authority if you're going to say that stuff. I'm not going to say it because John already has. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what He promised us. And what does that word say? He promised us eternal life. Seems pretty important. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in Him. Now do you see why I said that John's been leading up to this very section? All along, this is what he's been readying himself to say to his church. Are you ready to hear that today? I've been praying that you would be. Let's stick to the word, folks. But notice what he says right out of the bat. How does he refer to the people? He calls them what? Dear children. Do you think, look up a little bit from last week where somebody was up here, man, and they were going for it. Woo! How many times does he refer to the group he's speaking to as dear children? You see it several times. This is John. Do you think he cares about the people he is speaking to? Absolutely. He, this is an intimate connection that he's expressing. I read that. You know how I related to that? Man, I'm so grateful to serve with a group of leaders in this church that feel intimately connected to the people of God that he has called together, called Crosspoint. I, I connected to that because I feel that connection. I care a lot about you. I want you to know the truth and reject error. The world's trying to throw a bunch of error at us. And today, Christology is the most important thing that John's talking about. Christology means, what do we believe about who Jesus is? It's a big fancy word that I like to throw around because I want, it makes me feel important. No. No, but it really does express who Christ is. Christology, the study of who Christ is, is what's at the center of our, our message today. It's at the center of all of the book of John and 2 John and 3 John, well, and the Gospel of John and Revelation. All the things that John wrote. Christ is at the center. And he says, Dear children, I want you to be able to tell time. We're in the last hour. How do we know we're in the last hour? He says, because there are antichrists running around. There is the antichrist, and in fact, even now many antichrists have come. So this is a hard word to talk about because this is in the books of 1st, 2nd John, 3rd John. They're the only place we see this word. You don't see it in Revelation even. Right, Michael? It's not there. I mean, we talk about the Antichrist coming in Revelation, but guess what? That word isn't there. It's here. So how do we deal with this? It's, it's kind of a difficult word to, to deal with, so Dave threw me under the bus again. <laughs> so I think there's a couple of Antichrists we're talking in general. The NLT actually capitalizes the first 
when there's the definite article of the Antichrist. It's, it's these people that are within the church, by the way. Notice that. And there's somebody who is opposing the truth. Specifically opposing the truth about who Jesus is and how, who he revealed himself to be. That's who the Antichrist is. If you don't believe me, you can read down further. He, he delineates clearly what he, John is considering an Antichrist. That's why I said A and not A, because he's telling you we're in the last hour because you can't have an Antichrist unless there's been a Christ. So Christ is the A. Antichrist and everything that's a false teaching about who Jesus is is not A. It's an anti-A. It's an anti-Messiah teaching. And he goes, hey, look, this is how we know we're in the last hour because all of these antichrists have come. And they went out from us. That's a big moment. And you notice, just notice all the pronouns used here. They, 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 they. There, them. It's, it's, it's really, when I said that he was driving a line in the sand, that's the sand line there where he's going, look, they went out from us. They left the church. In fact, they never even belonged to us. He's, he's saying they didn't belong to us. He's saying if, here's a Tomism that I use all the time, but it's not original to me. He's saying, I will hear your words but I will trust your behavior. You said you were one of us, but the way you behaved shows that you weren't one of us. That's why he's using they. There's they and then there's us. And he's saying they are not A and we are A. Get that? Is there any in-between ground there? Do you see any gray area? No, but where do we love to live in life? I want to find a gray area. I like wiggle room. I, I, I'm using I like wiggle room. Is there any wiggle room here? You either believe a biblical Jesus or you're believing a false narrative. You're believing a lie. Do you see that? That's why he uses the term antichrist. It's a very strong term, is it not? It, it clearly cuts through the fog of what is truth. Because there's a bunch of people that John is scared, or not scared, but he's concerned for in the church. They went out from us, but they really, they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. And that word remained is going to be big, because that's a big word John saying, hey, here's how you stay steadfast, how you dwell, how you live, how you set down roots, how you put your foundation in Christ. And that's by believing the truth. And the problem is that we have a, a remain that's being applied to this group that left. I almost said pluperfect, but that's what it is. It's greeky, geeky stuff. But John is saying, look, there's a decision that they made way back then that they were not A. They were not followers of Christ. And they continued to behave that way from that point on. You may have thought they were with us because they sat in our pews, they worshipped maybe, they sang songs, but they were never with us because they believed something that was a lie. And not only did they believe it, but we're going to see that they were trying to preach it to the church. And so he says, they never belonged to us. They didn't remain with us. And that, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Verse 20 starts the second section of deny versus acknowledge. And then look at the pronouns moving forward. You, 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 you. He's talking to all of us in this room who have put their faith and trust in Christ. But you, notice how different he sees this situation. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Now this is another very curious word. Thanks a lot, Dave. This is a tough word because you don't see it. 
It's like here. I don't even know if it's used anywhere else. This anointing from the Holy One. I, I, this is just me, but I wonder if this word anointing is something that this not a group, this Antichrist group, was using. That somehow they had gotten this anointing from the Lord, and they heard a word from the Lord, and here's the truth. Everything you believed before was a lie. And we have an anointing. They're claiming this maybe ecstatic experience where they heard from, from the Spirit a new teaching. Guess what? Any teaching you hear better square with what the Bible says. Have you heard that from me before? Have you heard that from Dave before? Have you heard that from this church before? And that's what John is saying. Look, this anointing that from the Holy One. Now, who is the Holy One? Is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it God the Father? My answer is yes. All of them. I think maybe the Holy Spirit is most in focus because the word anointing is kind of connected to that because Jesus said it was good that he went away so that the Holy Spirit might come so that he may guide us into all truth. I think that's what we're seeing is John is saying, look, that's yours. That's yours for the taking. It's yours for the using. But you have a true anointing because what, we, what you heard squares with who Jesus really is. So he says, you have this anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Literally, you are in the know. Don't you like being in the know? It's terrible to be out of an inside joke, or you're, you realize you're in a room and everybody else is knowing what's going on, and you're not really, you don't have the handbook. Maybe that's like the first time you ever came to church. What is this all about? You know, the Holy Spirit wants you to be in the know. There's no hidden stuff here. It's all out on the table. And John says, you heard the truth and that anointing from God that taught you the truth, that has been teaching you the truth, you are in the know. The people who are antichrists are not. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. So, it sounds like truth has got to win out. And the, the center teaching by John, he's saying, look, what I taught you, that is the center of the universe as far as who Christ is. Liars are what the antichrists are and no lie can come out of the truth and since they are lying you can't believe what they say is true because look at how he f goes to the next section who is the liar and this is where you get the definition of what an antichrist is it is whoever denies that jesus is the christ let that sink in. Let it land on you. Because this teaching that you received, you're going to remain in it. They're going to at, we're going to be asked to do that. And let it work its, its way in you through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the truth. But anyone who does not believe in the biblical Jesus is a liar. John is saying that. Everything else is a lie. Call it that way. There is no gray area. It's either it's the truth or it's a, it's a lie. Amen? And now let's talk about this Jesus, the Messiah. It's the word Christ. Now, this word Christ, John is saying it in a totally new way from what the Old Testament unpacked about the Messiah. In a way that's even better understanding. Because if you asked your average Jew who knew the Old Testament, they would say, is the Messiah coming? They would say, yes. Who is that Messiah going to be? He's going to be a political figure who will raise the Jewish nation out of bondage. Did Jesus do that? Yes. Spiritually. But is this a, is this a way people were thinking about the Messiah, that he was going to be a political figure? Yes. 
Look at those disciples in the, in the book of Acts when Jesus is getting ready to leave. And what do they say? The dumbest thing. I love it, man. I just love it because, oh, I say dumb stuff too. Man, I go, I read the passage and it's like, okay, Jesus, are you going to set up your kingdom now? Political figure? And he's just like, oh, just wait for the Holy Spirit. Please, just wait for the Holy Spirit. Because the Christ that John is talking about here isn't just a political figure that God was going to bring to set the captives free. He was the incarnate God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Do you understand me? When John says Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ, he's saying he is the Word become flesh. He's saying that he is the Messiah that came down because you couldn't save yourself, climbed down into this pit of despair, and pulled us up from our despair and said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father. Yes. That's what John is saying here about Jesus is the Christ. And apparently there are some things that people were preaching that weren't that. If you look at John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, on the next page over, you'll see that there is something about a denial of Jesus coming in the flesh, right? There, I, we can't tell you everything they were teaching, but I can tell you some of the things they were teaching that were false. Somehow, this group of antichrists were saying that Jesus somehow was, didn't come in the flesh. And John's going, oh, no, no, no. Nay, nay. Jesus was there. I walked with him. He was in our midst. I saw him after the tomb was empty. I ran to that tomb, freaked out, stopped at the entrance. Peter just bludgeoned himself right in there. And then I peeked in, and that, that tomb was empty. And then we were gathering, and suddenly he was in our midst. That's the Christ that he's preaching. That's the Christ that we must continually be drawn back to. Do you get what I'm saying? Jesus is the Christ, the incarnate Son, the promised Messiah. And then he says very clearly, such a person who denies that is the Antichrist. See, I told you that's what he said is an Antichrist. It's not a freaky term, even though we we sort of made a lot out of that, haven't we? But an Antichrist is anybody who denies the biblical teaching of Jesus. Isn't that cool to know that? If someone comes and tells you, hey, this and that about Jesus, let me see what John's gospel says. Let me see what Matthew says. Let me see what Mark says. In fact, anybody that becomes a Christian, Mark is where I actually send them. Read the book of Mark because you can do it in one setting. Get this flow of who Jesus is and like that. No one who denies the Father. Oh, such a person is the Antichrist. Denying the Father and the Son. Okay, so here he's being very clear about what he sort of intimated last week, right? John is, de- he's saying Jesus the Son and God the Father, they're this. They're one. Because if you deny Jesus, he's saying, guess what you'd also deny? So, so it's either A or it's not A. Tom, are you telling me that, that it, 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 you just can't have a little bit and you can pick and choose? No, you can't. He's saying you deny Jesus, you deny it all. You get that? I mean, it's, it's a package deal. It's not like you get to go to the McDonald's of spiritual theology, biblical theology, and say, yeah, I'll have me some God the Father, but uh, leave out the Jesus, the Son. Oh, but I want a side of Holy Spirit. No. Package deal. It's all or nothing. I'm not saying that. I think the Word just said that. So then he goes into the no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. This is sort of like, this is the center spot right here. Everything that John has been saying has been building up to that statement right there. And everything that follows isn't a decline, it's a, it flows out from this truth. 
Think about how the world would have us believe. Think about how your flesh, my flesh, sort of struggles against this. Where it's either A or it's not A. And you and I need to be regularly visiting the truth so that you and I might continue to confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he is the incarnate son. That he is the Messiah. That he is my only hope. Jesus, my only hope is you. My only hope is you. Just keep saying that. Keep standing on that word because everything else is shifting sand. And then verse 24 moves into the last section of this passage. And he starts it again. As for you. The pronouns are still you. You, you, you. They are out there. You are in here. But as for you, see what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. That it would remain. What you have heard from the beginning, that it would remain in you. That you would dwell in it. That you would set your foundations in it. Did you hear me say that earlier? Because, oh, here we are again. What we were introduced to in this anointing of the Spirit, what the Spirit teaches us, it teaches us and guides us so that we might remain And why is John saying we have to remain? Because this life of Christianity is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Remain faithful is a long-term admonition to us. You know, put your faith and trust in Christ. Man, I remember that. Woo! This is awesome! And then like reality hit after a while. You know, you're all excited and you're just going around telling everybody about what this glorious thing you found, and then the enemy goes, whoa, oh. Lost one, got to go back there and try and mess with them. It's a, it's a marathon. And he's saying, look, you have a part to play. The remain, the first remain, there's actually two remains, the NLT and the NIV, none of them really do a good job of it. Good old NASB does a good job of it here. He's saying, the stuff you heard, let it remain. And then there's another remain because you need to let it continue to remain in your spirit. There's an active sense and there's a passive sense. We have a part to play and the spirit has a part to play. And both of those work in concert. Our part to play is, is really it's surrender, 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 surrender. Surrender to the truth. If it, was, if it was work harder, then Jesus would have been a Pharisee. When we ask to remain, it means Allow the truth to continue to pre- penetrate your heart, your life, your soul, your life. I'm going to draw on a whiteboard a little bit later on the so what part, and I'm going to really illustrate what are the things that I see about this, because I struggle with stupid PowerPoint. I can't get it to work for me, all right? But this remain is in my key idea because this is a key concept. John's concerned for his church because he wants them to continue to remain. It's my heart for you that you would continue to remain. That means that's not a message that's really kind of awesome sometimes because there are, like our walk with Jesus looks more like the stock exchange track. You know, it's up and down. It has its down. Sometimes your down will feel really down, but if you were to look back on your life, this down is higher even than an up was eight years ago. That's what remain means, this dwelling in Jesus over the long haul. If it does remain in you, you, will also, you also will remain in the Son and the Father. See, he's, he's pulling those two together again. The package deal. And this is what he promised. Eternal life in the Son. When you and I get to heaven, if, if we die and it comes time for judgment, we've st- spent some time in heaven with Jesus, but it comes time for judgment, we're all going to stand before the Father. We're going to have this judgment seat and we're all going to be judged for what we do. For those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, guess what that ends in? I see Jesus in you, man. Come on and hang out with me forever. That's eternal life. The alternative is not A, which is eternal. I think you said something about that last week. It's funny, the, the, the word is consistent, is it not? Jesus offers eternal life, 
The world and the enemy who is the false Messiah offers eternal death. He wants, you to, he wants it to seem sexy and very uh, uh, attractive, but it's long-term poor choice. Because eternal life is the answer to what fin- the finishing well and it remaining does for us. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. Now why is John concerned? Because there's a group of people that he loves very much that he's concerned are going to believe a lie. Is there something really at stake? Could these people he's writing to be led astray? Yes, he's saying that. So is there a danger to you and me? Could we be led astray? Yes, there's a a clear and present danger in that. Struggling for words, but that's what I mean, a clear and present danger to the body of Christ. And he says, they might, they're trying to lead, the, the world, by the way, you need to see it, it's actively trying to lead you astray. And then he kind of lands the plane in such, he sort of finishes this anointing discussion in verse 27. Look, the Spirit's been working in your life. As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you and you do not need anyone to teach you he's trying to give them blessed assurance i was a youth minister for a lot of years 20 something years and over the years students would come to me and say i don't feel saved how do i know i'm saved i do bad stuff all the time and i would say why are you coming to me and they would say well i'm concerned i'm not saved I said, well, then you are. What do you mean? If you're concerned, if you're not saved, guess what you are? Because guess what the world doesn't concern itself with? It isn't worried whether or not it's saved. Like if you're concerned about it because the Holy Spirit's kind of talking to you, it's not about salvation. It's about remaining. It's about the fact that, oh, you need some refilling. John's saying, look, you could be led astray here. Now, is this eternal led astray? Man, I'm not going there. But I can tell you that don't get led astray. John's worried about getting led astray, so let's be worried about getting led astray. Let's make sure we're listening to the truth. Let's make sure that we have blessed assurance. Let's make sure that you and I trust on what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. Amen? That we're, we're, we're collecting ourselves around other people who are thinking and doing the same thing. We need each other. It's not the Lone Rangers of Christ. It's the body of Christ. Because it's a marathon, guess what you can do if you're running with people in a marathon? You can run better. You can last longer. You can run faster than if you're all by yourself. If you've ever run cross country, you know that deal. If you've ever run a long race, you know that deal. This is a long-term race. We need each other in this. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Okay, now let's, there's some so what's at the bottom of your page. This is old tech, man, but it works. I said earlier, I'll hear your words, but I'll trust your behavior. You know what that means? Here's the truth. You and I cannot act counter to what we believe. Listen to that. Ultimately, you and I cannot act counter to what we believe. I mean long term. Can you fake it for a little while? Yes, because we all can hold our breath. Right? So the first so what? Evaluate what you believe based on the Bible. First, so what? Number one, evaluate what you believe based on the Bible. Let me say it again so you can write it down. Evaluate what you believe based on the? How do you know what the Bible says? Well, you gotta? I wish Dave would say, read your Bible a little bit more. (laughs) No, man, read your Bible because you know why? Because you leak. Because I leak. We need to be reminded of the truth. And we have to, we can get off track. We need to make sure we're on track. 
and that we're not being deceived. Let me tell you something. I want to, we cannot act apart from our belief system, which is why I always tell you, Christian, don't look and evaluate yourself in the moment. Look at a seven-year span. What has God done in your life over the last seven years? If it looks like the market, good. You're on the right track. This world is ups and downs. This flesh wars against my innermost man. Read Romans 7. Paul says, everything I want to do, I do the opposite. I want to tell my wife I love her. I end up frustrating her. There's a reality in Tom Douglas land. Here's another thing that I've noticed about what I see in church that is not biblical. So let's say I'm going to draw a circle here, and you think it's actually a circle because it, well, I guess it came out pretty good. (laughs) Cool. Can you see the circle in the back? All right. In the circle, there's all these segments, right? And, And these all represent part of your life, right? Do we kind of get that, like, work and marriage and kids and college and mortgage and fill in the blank of all that, right? So this, this represents me. And what I see masquerading as true Christianity is that uh, Jesus fits right there. Okay? So in the midst of all that makes up me, here's Jesus. He's a part of me. You know what that ends up being? Jesus is a self-help guru that I have him mixed into all that makes up me that I might be a better me. And then who's at the top of the circle? No, me. It doesn't say you. Did you guys go to public school too? I want you to personalize this though. Don't make it you, make it me. Okay? And so Jesus is a compartmentalized part of what makes up me. Is that what the Bible is unveiling about who Jesus is in a person's life? If you notice, there's not just a pen up here. There's an, there's an eraser. Me is not here. Who's here? Let's put Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Or God. That's who's up here. And Jesus isn't down here. Me is. Mom, this is terrible English, isn't it? <laughs> Me is. And guess what? I would put, uh, what, Jim, I just saw you first. Jim's right here. And then you're going to write your name in here. And if this is what the life of Christ is really about, and this is who's at the top, guess what all of my life is living in the context of? Who God is. That means everything about me is living in light of who Jesus is in my life. Is that not worth time spent on this concept? But see, the other version where I'm and me is at the top is a self-help. That's not what Jesus is saying. I want all of you. All of me needs to be under who God is. That means how... For Tom Douglas, that means how Tom drives his car. Man, is that not a place Jesus lives in my life. That that means the the area of Tom's life that is anger-filled because I don't like feeling out of control. I substitute anger a lot when I feel out of control. Sound familiar? I hate that about me. I hate it. But if I live like this, and, and that's got to be God's too, that means I've got to surrender that to him. Because I can't work hard enough to make anger not part of my life. But I can surrender it out, right? So use the Bible to check yourself and evaluate what you believe. Secondly, evaluate based on spiritual friendships. Woo! That's called church. Right? Not Lone Rangers of Christ. we got to gather with all these names in here because we need each other. We, we cannot do this on our own. 
Fortunately, those who John is writing to, guess who one of their spiritual friendships is? John. How awesome is that? But guess what you and I can do? We can get into a Bible study or into a fellowship of men or women and families that are talking about this stuff, that want to live their lives like this, not trying to lord over you what you're doing wrong, but saying, look, I need forgiveness. Come be with me and let's be forgiven together. And let's live according to the truth. Let's go to my brother uh, Rick's class on Sunday mornings and hear the truth and be changed by it. Because it's not about another Bible study. It's about being changed by the truth. So we need spiritual friendships to help evaluate what we believe. Guess what Apostle Paul did? He went away for quite a while and studied and made sure that he was believing the right thing. Then he came back and came to the apostles and said, here's what I'm going to teach. Is it right? He came under their spiritual guidance as fellow Christians. They said, yep. So he went to a church and said, here, I want to go. Antioch Church sent him off. Okay, so spiritual friendships. Bible, spiritual friendships. And then evaluate what you believe based on the Spirit of God. That anointing that John talks about, it, that's another thing to consider. Because you know what you really are? It, here's what you really are. You're really a radio. And the, the radio uh, that you are can tune into the Spirit anytime you want. You know what? The Spirit is always talking to you. It's whether or not you're tuned in. You know where you can really tune in? With other believers. While you're reading the Word. While you're in prayer. This is not something that's a throwaway point. It's a pretty important point to John. He's saying, look, that Spirit, as you've been listening to it, has been guiding you. So this is where we want to land the plane. And this is where we want to make room for our worship team because I'm landing the plane now. Have I made it clear enough that I'm landing the plane? (laughs) Because we just have, we have to keep going to these places to go to the Word, go to spiritual friendships that God has given you. Who are some people in your life? Who are the people in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood? But then there's another thing that's in there too from Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the other. If you come here and you're like, man, these people have something. I sense they have something that I think I want. And so, I want to offer you a chance to put your faith and trust in Christ. It's not anything big. It's very quiet. In your heart, you just say, Jesus, I am lost without you. I realize that I've been following a false gospel, and I need you to come to me. Let me pray, and I'm going to just lead us in a word of prayer, and part of that's going to be a salvation prayer. It's nothing special. It's not that you have to pray that. It's that your heart is there. Father God, thank you for your word that it is true. Thank you for John in his gospel. Thank you for his letters. Thank you for the truth that he's proclaiming to us today. And Father, if there's someone here who's listening online, or is here this morning and you, you, they're just realizing right now that you were calling them and that today was a divine appointment just for them. Father, that they would put their faith and their trust in Christ. Call your family back to you if we're far afield, that somehow we have lost ourselves and gotten off the path. Draw your children back to you. Draw them back to your truth. Continue to make this place a place where not perfect people live, but people who are being perfected in Christ. That you would continue to guide us by your Spirit. It's in his name we say, Amen.